I'm Nairi Woods and I'm uh, Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government and it's a great pleasure to welcome you on, here on behalf of the four partners of this conference, Linklaters, who, have, who had the idea to take this project forward and spurred a wonderful cooperation that's been going ever since. Between them, the Skoll Centre for Social Enterprise at the Said Business School at Oxford, CAMFED and the Blavatnik School of Government. And it's this grouping of institutions that collaborated to do the first annual seminar last year on advancing good governance for international development. Let me say right away that when we talk about governance, what we're talking about is how it is that an organization can be held to account by those it's trying to serve. And so for this year's seminar, you'll see the title, and I was asked to note that it was a provocative title. It was provocative among the organizing committee. Um, the sustainability of impact for the sector or for the client title. And we're gonna unpack that in today's opening session and then in subsequent sessions. So, with, with those preparatory comments um, underway, I'd like to open the uh, first session of today's conference. And I guess our thinking about this is every single person in this room is working in, around, or on development with good intentions, with intentions to help a community, to work with a community, to work with partners, to increase the well-being of a group of people somewhere in the world. And I guess we've come together for this seminar to explore what kind of path are we building with these good intentions? It is, is it a pathway to good, to bad, or through the middle that we could improve? Is it a pathway that best suits the sector, by which we mean the NGOs, the social entrepreneurs, the companies, the development agencies, and the governments who are involved? Or is it a pathway that best suits those whom these agents are trying to serve? In other words, the clients or the community itself. And in this opening panel, I thought it would be very interesting to challenge um, the participants of the conference by thinking hard about not just what the sharpest challenges of development are, but what the role of government is in those challenges. Because it's curiously absent from debates about governance. And so, in fact, some would say that the term governance was coined almost deliberately to avoid the elephant in the room, which is government itself. And yet, Governments in many communities around the world are the elected representatives of the people. They, do, they are the group which is best resourced to serve the public good and to serve the public interest. And they are accountable through law, through budgets, through the media, and through stakeholders. So it's a curious thing that they are absent from many debates about how to advance good governance in international development. Because if we're looking for more accountability to those development is trying to serve, you would imagine that governments would almost be first in the line of accountability. And that's the question that I'm going to put to today's panelists, which is to say, is government the problem or the solution or part of each? And I'm delighted to have a great panel to explore this question. So on my right, I have Trevor Manuel, who has been serving the South African government ever since he and those brave South Africans that fought against the system of apartheid managed to create a revolution in South Africa and bring a new government into being in 1994. And you'll all know that Trevor has served as Minister of Finance in, the, in that government, uh, now as head of the Planning Commission, but also on many international commissions looking at the different aspects of international development. On my left, 
I have Mtuli Nkube, who is chief economist in the African Development Bank. He was previously dean of the Commerce, Law and Management uh, faculty at the University of Witzvaterstrand, and has also been an investment banker, a regulator, a researcher, um, and seen most sides of the development equation, but perhaps no, in no place more sharply than where he sees them now in the African Development Bank. And then on my right, Charles Kenny, returning to Rhodes House after many years, um, who is currently a researcher in the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C., having spent a long period doing research at the World Bank. But Charles is best known at this moment in his life for his terrific book, Getting Better, Why Global Development is Succeeding and How We Can Improve the World Even More. Now, there's a positive title. Um, <laughs> it's a book that it's rumored Bill Gates insisted that everyone working for the Gates Foundation um, should read, and, um, and likewise, I'd recommend it to, to all of you. So we've got a terrific panel to ask this, this question of. So Trevor, let me turn to you for a quick starter on is government the problem or the solution? Thanks. Uh, th th there's a step before government, uh, and it's, it's also something that's, that's a dirty word, and it's politics. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ashimoglu and, 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 and Robinson defined politics as uh, the process by which a society chooses the rules that will govern it. And so we, we have to recognize what the role of politics is in all of this, and development is a consequence, I submit, of good politics. Mm -hmm. Now, the debate on government or not is actually uh, quite interesting because uh, just to provoke discussion, I'm going to put it that, that much of the work of CSOs and NGOs is actually apolitical, single issue focused, um, and, and uh, uh, you, you, you see it. Young people get involved, passionately involved. Uh, I don't know how much you've read about the impact of social media in, uh, uh, in the Arab Spring. It's going to arise as a consequence of Taksin as well. Uh, so everybody is, is on YouTube, bad things, you've seen it in Syria. Uh, everybody tweets about the revolution. The truth is it doesn't convert into governance that improves in the quality of life of people. That's a hard work that requires a different kind of organization, that requires not just a single focus, it requires a broad pan of issues, but more importantly, it requires accountability. And that link is fundamentally important. So I think that, that we need to explore the interrelationships and the locus of the low key of decision making between elected government, voice frequently articulated in the short term and around issues by, by, by NGOs and sometimes external players style donors. Mm -hmm. Now, in Africa, we even call the IMF a donor. Mm -hmm. um, it's never given anything. The World Bank doesn't give away anything. So it's not a donor, but they style donors, but their, their influence is actually profoundly important in this regard as well. Uh, the IMF uh, committed 2009, $484 million to supporting NGOs, but is it supporting against or for? <laughs> How do you define democracy in this context? And I'm gonna stop there. Great, thank you. So, um, <laughs> Tuli, Trevor says, Development is a consequence of good politics. Is that, is that what you would say? I, I agree with that, uh, absolutely. I, I've studied all the elections in Africa since 1960, all of them. Legislative and presidential, about 700 elections. And that's where e elections are often the points of inflection, where you see politics play which results, as Trevor said, in, in government as a result. Looking at, for instance, were these, were these elections violent, which speaks to how the government of the day thinks about you know, what it ought to do to stay in power? Was it peaceful? Who won? And, and was the, the resultant government a winner-take-all? Uh, was it a coalition? Did you have a standoff? All those kind of things. And then what was the impact on the economy down the line of the, of the government that came in? Uh, in terms of growth, of course, which is easier to measure than development, which is a much more nuanced process. So Trevor is absolutely right. 
the, the politics gives rise to some government and how that government is put together and how it governs. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. But I must say this though, Nairi, that look, a government is not always the problem. I've described a scenario where, you know, it's not always the problem. But also you do have market failures. That's one thing about the financial crisis that it is, you know, shines the torch on market failures and you need governments to intervene, whether, you know, fiscally, it's through fiscal expansion, whether it's causing central banks to do something about it in terms of quantitative easing and other things. Government has a role to play. So, so government can be a solution. It can be a problem. Look, if there's no government, who's going to provide the, the public goods? One of the reasons why we've made very little progress in Africa on water and sanitation delivery as, as, an, as an MDG is because it is the one area where the private sector cannot easily get in <laughs> in, in Africa. Everywhere else we've made progress, uh, or government knows what to do. Uh, so who's going to provide some of these very basic uh, services? It can only be government. I don't see the, the private sector uh, you know, doing this effectively. Certainly the profits are much more difficult to, to, to milk. So simple public goods provision is what government are, are, are good at, and we should uh, capacitate government to, 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 to do it well. Uh, who's going to regulate the markets, regulate or whatever is going on in terms of economic activity? It can only, only be done by a player such as the government. The markets cannot self-regulate. Uh, look at what happened to the credit default swap market uh, uh, in the financial sector, which is a self-regulating uh, regulating market. Uh, we have each self-insurance mechanism. It didn't work. Uh, and, and, and the rest is history, as they say. There are also certain uh, investments we need, whether it's roads, or dams, and so forth, which require both governments and the public sector. It cannot just be uh, the private sector, because these are semi-public goods. So you need both government, a good government, and the, and, 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 and the private sector. So simple PPPs require a, a good government to be running uh, things. Uh, let, let, let me go back to, to Trevor's point about politics uh, uh, being a driver of, of government, uh, of good government. What we found in this research was that it matters uh, the outcome of elections and then the government thereafter. It, it, it is driven by the, the abundance of extractive resources. So they're the key mm -hmm. of the type of politics that emerges and therefore you know, creates government. It also uh, uh, matters how long the ruling party has been in power. Uh, I, I know Trevor wouldn't want me to, to, to say this, being a member of the ANC, so am I. It, which it. is that it also <laughs> matters whether the incumbent party is a liberation movement or not. It also matters who colonized you, which is a, a Ashamoglu Robinson thesis, that the institutions that arise are a function of the heritage of the, of the colonial uh, 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 era. So, so yes. Governments and markets both have failures. Governments can be a solution. It can be a problem. And, and we, there are points of inflection where we can pick this up very easily. OK, well, let's, let's um, pick that up in a, in, a, in a moment, because it might seem like an odd message to people that, that government um, should be the driver of development, because the response would be that governments have proven to be so slow, so unresponsive, so entrenching of existing interests, and therefore so incapable of delivering what communities need. And surely that's why all these other sectors have flourished. But let me first come to Charles Kenny to ask Charles, you know, Charles, in your book about what kind of aid works, it seems to me that one of your messages, I hope I haven't got it wrong, is that because Minister Manuel, Professor Nkube have basically said to us it's getting the politics right that matters. But one of the messages of your book, looking at the data, is that don't put aid into trying to make the politics right. Put aid into trying to solve specific problems because that's the kind of aid that works. You're better to try to eradicate polio than you are to try to bring about democracy in a country. So, so is that right? And um, do you agree with your uh, two fellow panelists about the centrality of government and politics? Yes and yes. And I think it's because there are sort of two different questions there. There's what matters for development and there's what can aid do. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree more that what matters for development writ large um, is, 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 is good government. Um, and I, I think, you know, 
One, it better be, because governments everywhere, countries rich or poor, are 30, 40 percent of GDP. <coughs> um, Sub-Saharan African government expenditure uh, last, uh, in 2011 was uh, $363 billion. That compares to aid flows to Sub-Saharan Africa of $42 billion. And you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is the most aid dependent. So you know, government is just the biggest player in town, even in the poorest countries in the world with one or two exceptions which tell you interesting things about what happens when all you're left with, if you will, is NGOs and CSOs. Mm. Haiti is a country where NGOs and CSOs and donors in general have a lot more money to play with than the government does. Mm. Since the earthquake, I don't know if anybody would claim that the, the international response has been an immense success, but there's one group you really can't blame for that, and that's the government. Because of all the aid flows that have gone to Haiti since the earthquake, 1% has gone to the Haitian government. The rest has gone to Beltway Bandits, uh, NGOs, uh, you know, a bunch of people, many of whom have all the right intentions and very um, you know, clever ways of, of delivering targeted assistance to desperate people. But it doesn't add up to Haiti having you know, a functioning society, a functioning economy again. It adds up to a lot of people still in camps, still on sort of lifeline services. Without government, you don't get beyond Haiti. And so I think you really, you know, you just need strong government. And I think, you know, most good NGOs realize that. I mean, you know, up the street, Oxfam, you know, there's, the, there's Duncan Green going on about from poverty to power. This is a book all about politics. It's, it's all about you know, getting government to work better because, you know, ultimately government is, you know, the big part of the solution. That doesn't mean there's no role for NGOs. Obviously, Duncan Green doesn't think that. He's working in Oxfam. Um, <laughs> it means that there, a huge and important role for NGOs, perhaps the biggest one, is to get governments to work better. And they can do that in lots of different ways. They can uh, uh, come up with innovative approaches that hopefully governments can scale if they work. They can, they can use um, 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 their power to uh, mobilize people for you know, meaningful political reform, not just Twitter campaigns, but meaningful political reform. So there's a huge role for NGOs and CSOs, but it, it is you know, ultimately, you know, if they don't get government to work better, there's going to be a, a, a real limit to that. Now, when it comes to aid, I don't think you can argue with the success of aid when it comes to especially global health. The small, smallpox campaign was cheap, but largely financed by uh, you know, the, the Rotary, the WHO, uh, even USAID, which I rarely have nice things to say about. Um, uh, uh, you know, again, the fact that measles deaths are at sort of one-tenth of the level they were worldwide 15, 20 years ago, aid is a huge part of that story. Bed nets have flooded Africa, perhaps not sustainably, but bed nets have flooded Africa over the last 10 years, and we've seen malaria death rates drop through the floor. It's, if Africa had been reducing child mortality at the rate it has in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. since 1990, when the MDGs sort of officially start, if you will, they'd be on track for the two-thirds reduction in child mortality by, by, by 2015. You know, sadly, the reductions only really started in 2000. But a big part of that reduction, I think, is, is aid, is, is bed nets. Now, you know, so I'm, I'm hugely in favor of aid and more aid, and, and um, CSOs and NGOs played a huge role in actually getting those bed nets um, out in many countries. So you know, I don't mean to say there is, there's no role for NGOs and CSOs. I think there's, there's, there's a huge role. But you know, bed nets, again, is a kind of classic example. What happens tomorrow if the aid stops? What happens tomorrow if the NGOs walk away? If you don't have governments there you know, to pick up the slack, to systemize, systemize, systematize this, sorry, and make you know, bed net provision part of a systemic uh, 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 set of, of, of interventions that provide it to all people, you know, immunizations, antibiotics access, uh, 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 teaching parents about oral rehydration therapy, um, bed nets, so on. You know, this isn't going to last. This isn't sustainable. So, so it has to end, I think, with governments. So, and, and there, Charles, you've taken us to the heart of what this um, Advancing Good Governance in International Development Seminar is about. Because once you engage those NGOs, social entrepreneurs, and aid agencies, 
there's always the risk that they begin life with exactly those intentions, but far from designing an exit strategy and thinking about how to make what they're doing sustainable, all too quickly they make themselves the sustainable element. They think about how they can sustain themselves as an NGO and get more funding and get more members, how they as an aid agency can demonstrate their performance to ensure next year's budget comes through. In other words, the gaze which it begins on the clients very quickly becomes a gaze mainly focused on the funders, the members, and those to whom they officially account. And I think that's what, it's that conundrum that brings this group together. So we've got two issues on this table today, and one is this strong voice from those experienced in these issues about the centrality of government and politics and the other about the uses of aid and donors, but the need for them to think about what role they're playing. Can I just open up to a couple of questions from you before coming back to our panelists? So any questions, challenges, or did you come here today also thinking that actually this should be about improving government? Or did you come here today thinking actually that your NGO or your organization or your research which might not be about governments, is important for development because... Um, I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I think it's and. Um, I think in the case of WaterAid, we're trying to help people raise their voices so that they can hold the institutions to account, but also supporting them to be able to provide services as well. And yes, we look to um, raise our own profile and raise our income, but that's because we want to have greater impact for those that we're here to serve, which is people that don't have a glass of water to drink, who don't have a toilet. Mm -hmm. So I think the two don't have to be mutually exclusive. They should be and. And in our case, always keeping our focus on one day, we don't want to be here. We want local institutions, governments, private sector, and civil society to be providing water and sanitation to all. And so just while we have you, so what would you say is the most effective part of your exit strategy? Well, our support is to try and see a world. We've set ourselves, um, uh, because we want to encourage the world to do more on water and sanitation, we say the world could get water and sanitation to every person in this world by 2030. Um, and so the exit strategy for us is to try and have the maximum impact we can through uh, supporting local organisations so that vision becomes a reality. So thank you. Um, Trevor, you know, you're heading the Planning Commission in South Africa. You've looked at these water issues. It's a constitutional right in South Africa for citizens to have access to water. How important are organisations like WaterAid to achieving that constitutional goal? I think they, they, they have a very important role to play because at one level, water, access to water and sanitation, in my view, is a rights issue. Uh, and ensuring that people uh, know their right uh, is, 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 is fundamentally important. But I think that you also need the partnership to extend through because responsibility becomes a big issue. In our country, where we have that right to a right of access, mm -hmm. um, uh, the recognition that we're a water-scarce country means that we need to engage people differently in the responsibility of managing the right. And this, this increasingly is becoming a problem. Uh, when, I, when I look at the situation in China now, water is such a big issue. When I look at uh, in, interesting debates, uh, uh, NGOs, <clears throat> for instance, on the malaria issue, the most effective, and yeah, I'm, I'm likely to, to be pilloried this afternoon, but the most effective uh, prevention uh, of, of, of malaria is still DDT. NGOs don't like DDT. It gets into the water occasionally. We've got to talk about this. Uh, do you want uh, our, our families dying? Or, or how do we resolve these issues? Can we keep it? out of agricultural use and focus only on anti-malaria treatments. These are fundamentally important discussions we must have, but they must be had with the people, not on their behalf. 
And, and Trevor, if, to the extent that you are working with international aid agencies, NGOs and such like, what do you wish they might do differently? You know, I mean, I think in general terms, in general terms, and, and, and let, me just, let me just preface my remarks uh, by, by uh, reminding people that I come from the barricades. I didn't get into politics via university. I come from the barricades. I've, I've, I've been an activist, and I think I still have the head of an activist, notwithstanding the fact I've been in government for almost uh, two decades. Um, it's, it's that ability tr to transcend just the raising of the voice to sharing the responsibility. That, I think, is a fundamentally important part of the equation that we must have on the table. But what, what does that mean for water aid? How should they share the responsibility? Uh, well, I'm, 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 I'm using the example. I mean, once the water is there, you know, um, we, we in, in, in South Africa provide free basic water to every household. Uh, the demand for water increases, partly because we don't take collective responsibility for managing the limited resource. Mm -hmm. We need NGOs in partnership with communities ensuring mm -hmm. that that appreciation is actually translated into actions that will ensure sustainability of our water resource in the instance of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Great. Uh, further questions? Can we come? All right. Well, thank you so much for um, your uh, presentations. And I just want to pick, off, uh, pick up from where Professor Nkube just uh, left off earlier about um, the question of liberation movements as governments within the, the continent. And I think the, it seems to me that there, there's a big problem that a lot of our uh, public sectors are not professionalized. And I'd like to find out, um, perhaps from the rest of the panel, what it would look like to uh, create an avenue for young, talented people to be able to enter into um, to government by way besides the barracks, perhaps through the political science departments and, and what that would look like. Through um, the Blavatnik School of Government. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> anyway, yes. And other such institutions. Well, thank you. That's right. Okay, uh, okay, okay. let me have a go. I'm, I'm sure uh, Trevor and Charles have something to say here. You know, certainly, I think it's important for government to also begin to think of attracting the best talent uh, in government in terms of young people getting in, into government. Uh, we were speaking to, about, you know, I was speaking to Nairi uh, earlier uh, about how we can, we can do this in Africa, and she's already doing a great job within the Blavatnik School. Really I, I, identifying young talent out there, maybe the undergraduate or out, outside the university system, uh, to come into the Blavatnik School or any other school and be prepared for, for public service, service, the best people, uh, but also for, for, for the, 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 these interns or the students to feel that uh, government, is where, is government is where they want to be. It, it's, it's cool to be in government. It's not, it's not uncool. You, you, it's not just private sector or, or NGO or social entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. I think that culture just needs to be developed, needs to be uh, promoted, needs to be uh, uh, su supported. Um, what, what, what we are doing at, at the bank, as an example, we are, we are trying to do that already, uh, uh, identifying a talent that could be you know, pushed into government, but also uh, uh, capacity developing and supporting those who are already in government and are coming up through the ranks, giving them different skills so they stay there. Uh, hopefully, government pays them enough to, 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 to stay there. The, 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 this, this is very, very important. Uh, think, think about, uh, go back and look at Singapore. There are some of you who are better than me at articulating those kind of stories. How um, Lee Kuan Yew, or indeed Mahathir to an extent in, in Malaysia, uh, uh, managed to turn a government into a prestigious institution for, for, for employment, for, for young graduates, for, 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 for young, uh, young talent. It, it, it's not easy to do, but, but it can be done. There's an example out there, and let's use everything we can to, to make it happen. Uh, it, but also, make, let's make it easy for for individuals in the private sector to spend time in government. So you've got a kind of secondment system. I think, Trevor, we tried that with, was it the Commissioner of Police? I can't remember one time, mm -hmm. a few other cases. And then you see people from the consulting firms, uh, KPMG and McKinsey, working with government in the planning commission mm -hmm. and, and, and other parts of government. And that, that's also important, that movement back and forth. Uh, and, and maybe, let's say, people also from the NGO sector 
uh, working in government, back and forth, infusing talent as a way to make government uh, work better. <coughs> but um, Tuli, you've, you've brought the example of Singapore and Malaysia, mm. and in those countries where you have a very strong government, NGOs and other uh, development partners play quite an important role holding that strong government to account. <coughs> That's right. In different African countries, people would say the reverse has happened, where you've not got a strong government and, in, and you've got NGOs and development actors not holding a strong government to account, but trying to replace the government, <coughs> almost creating a separate parallel world mm. next to government. Can they play a, a stronger role in African countries holding governments to account? Where do you see development partners best playing that role? Mm. I, I think you're exactly right. I, I would like the, the NGOs to continue to play that role. <coughs> of civil society, strengthening civil society voice in, 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 our, in our countries, making sure that governments can be held to account. I, I think that's important. Um, I'm not convinced that there is any NGO there trying to be a parallel government, really. Governments, when they are powerful, they are very powerful, actually, and they can, they can pass a law to ban NGOs. It's happened before. They just ban him, you know, simple. Um, so, so I, I think we want, to, want you to be there, be the voice of, of, of you know, civil society, and host government, uh, have government to account. I think the, but, but really, at the end of the day, we would like the skill of holding government to account to be transferred to the citizens themselves. So you cannot substitute the citizens and speak on their behalf, as Trevor was saying. You, you need to train people to be, to be demanding citizens on their governments, and to demand transparency to realize that voting, if you're allowed to vote, <laughs> is, 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 the, is how you should express your, yourself in terms of your preferences. So yeah, I, I think NGOs should be allowed to do what they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just want to uh, uh, follow up on this. I, I, I think this is an area where aid, can, aid and uh, 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 international NGOs can actually be positively harmful. Um, sort of for, you know, 50 years now, uh, the aid community's had this idea about uh, 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 smallholder farmers in Africa that you know, what they lacked was the, the, uh, the, 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 the intelligence and the knowledge to farm well, and that's why they weren't using all of these practices, which we knew would raise their farm yields. And the more you get into why it is that a lot of, of these approaches aren't used, it is, it's back to politics. It's about politics within the household. It's about politics within the village. It's about uh, politics across the country. It's not, it's not that they don't know or they're dumb. It's that they are operating under a very different set of, 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 of norms and rules and uh, you know, incentives than we know about. Our ignorance doesn't lead to very good uh, as a rule, does not lead to very good uh, uh, extension practices when it comes to farming. I think basically the aid community has the same attitude towards African governments as it has to smallholder farmers. These people, they don't know how to do it right. And I think that's very, very rarely the problem. I think most of the time, you know, the incentives of politics are different. And so when Donors and sorry, you know, I used to work for the World Bank, and I'd go off to countries and tell them what to do. So when donors, including me, uh, uh, you know, go off to countries and say, not at the African Development Bank, we don't tell them what to do. <laughs> completely different. I just had to um, correct that. Uh, 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 you know, go off to a country and say, you know, in my case, there is one way to run your telecoms uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sector, and it's this way. You know, how dare you not have an independent regulator? Um, you know, uh, that is very problematic. And the much better way of doing these things is things like financing people to go to schools of government, as it might be, and learn from each other, rather than thinking that, you know, we have the answer. But the real problem with that TA is not just that it's probably a lot of it wasted because we're giving bad advice. It's that it involves hiring a whole load of people away from government. It's back to this issue of how do you make government cool. Well, one of the ways you don't make government cool is by offering somebody five, six times the salary to leave government and do something fairly similar for an NGO or, 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 or for an aid agency. And we do that all the time. And you know, we think, well, yeah, 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 but, but, but you know, we're actually going to deliver these services to these people, you know, which is better than government, which won't. Well, you know, 
Of course, government won't. If you actually you know, are, are poaching everybody who's been there for two years and have finally learned how government works. I think it's a real problem. I think that that's right. And, but, and it comes from good intentions. Yeah. You join an NGO or you join a development agency which goes and tells people in other communities what to do. And then you stop and you say, this is terrible. It should, we should be local. It should be locals working out what to do. So we need to hire locals in the country. So the next step is you hire locals. And very quickly, you're the international NGO who's taking the very best locals out of government to work for you in the NGO. And then before you know it, you've excavated the governance. So, and we see, I think, I'm sure all of us have seen this in capacity building programs being run by international agencies around the world, where capacity building involves depriving a government of its best capacity in order that those people can train other people to take their places in government. So there is definitely a problem there. Um, how many people in this room work for an NGO, an aid agency, a donor agency? Hands up. Okay. And how many of you hire local people? <laughs> Which probably so Invest. tell us, how do you avoid this problem? How do you stop yourself building cavities into government, excavating the best talent in the country. Any, any ideas? Can yes. Oh, one moment, we'll give you a microphone. The example was given of Singapore. Now, last time I checked, and admittedly it was a long time ago, ministers in Singapore were paid around $600,000 a year. Mm -hmm. That's a long time ago. Yeah, I think it's probably a lot more. I probably, probably so for those a, of you, so a, million, a, a million or so uh, these days. I don't think any per, they don't get any perks at all. And if they or if anyone else in the government is found guilty of anything corrupt or untoward, uh, they get fired and probably jailed. Um, and uh, you know, I think that that, uh, that that and for other reasons, it is a very prestigious thing uh, to, to to be in, in government in Singapore. But uh, many gov uh, governments in developing countries are not paying people a market rate, partially because they can't afford it. But one of the reasons they can't afford it is often the purpose of government is mixed up for, with various political purposes to hire large quantities of people as opposed to carry out the functions of government. So if you pay a market rate, then you're going to get good people. But don't expect to get good people uh, if you pay 10% um, uh, of the market rate. You can maybe do it for a short period, but it won't work in the, in the long run. I, I'd actually like to come in uh, on the issue and, and just say to the Blavatnik students, uh, just check with them. I don't know if you've told them yet, Mary, that uh, before they leave next week, they get a little chip implanted. <laughs> and uh, they'll be trapped for life. There's no way they're going to leave public service broadly defined. It's part of the deal, and so uh, they better understand that. Uh, that's what the School of Government is about. Um, but <clears throat> I, I'd actually just like to come back to your, your issue. You know, in South Africa, in an interesting way, we built, we built a strong treasury, and we built it primarily with young people. We built it with young people because we wanted to change what happened in the public service. And the public service used to be about job security and the pension. And we wanted people to come in and commit to a period of about five years, and most of them stayed beyond that because it was a good place to be. Now, Paolo has been involved in, in the Budget Transparency Initiative. And, and one of the things that we did was actually within government to open an avenue. And the reason why the South Africa scores high on the Budget Transparency Index is because people in the Treasury provide the information that ensures that other departments are held to account. So it is actually <clears throat> foremost about transparency from within government. That's right. Yeah. And that's what made that venture so attractive. Yeah. But young people need to go in <clears throat> and find their way, and other people will feel that they're being squeezed out, but that's okay. Uh, I'm sure that under Nairi you would learn about how to fight, and that's fundamentally important because that's what, what's going to carry you through. On, <clears throat> on the issue of salaries, um, you know, we, we've done this exercise with others, 
In South Africa, in, in PPP terms, our teachers for the first 10 years of their lives, are, of their working lives, are paid amongst the highest in the world. That's right. But our education outcomes are abysmal. And so it's more than salaries. Yeah. It's, about, it's about understanding those interrelationships. I, I was talking about water, but it's also ensuring that public servants know and understand their accountability mm -hmm. uh, to society. And that, that's a fundamentally important issue. And that's not just about elected politicians. It's about focusing on service delivery and the quality of services. And I think in, in a range of these issues, we need to find support uh, from non-government to ensure that we can advance in these kinds of issues. Mtuli? I just want to come uh, add to, uh, to what Trevor said about service delivery. You know, we just two case studies. I studied uh, the behavior of doctors uh, and teachers in Senegal and Tanzania. In, in Senegal, the doctors are, are, are in the rural areas are spending something like two and a half hours a day consulting with patients. Teachers are teaching four hours a day as opposed to the normal eight hours. And then uh, in Tanzania, not much different. In Tanzania, actually, the clinicians are spending 30 minutes attending to patients. I don't know what they do the rest of the day. Some applies to teachers. And this is a pattern that you see everywhere. And I just want to link that to the issue of, again, not having the right incentives at that level, the right monitoring and supervisory mechanisms. And in fact, they make you realize that actually, in a way, government delivers bottom up <coughs> and not top down. That if it doesn't happen at that level, uh, uh, there's no service delivered at that level, then we've got a problem. But also the issue of local area politics kicks in. Mm. When we have local elections every three years, nothing moves. I tell you, two years before the election, the, the person is already campaigning, uh, getting all the teachers to campaign on their behalf. And, it's very disruptive. Uh, so, so really, sometimes it's not about just looking at how central government is doing things. At that local level, that's why it happens or does not happen. So service delivery, local area politics, quality of supervision is a big issue. Uh, I, as I say, I saw those figures on, on, from Senegal and Tanzania. I know it's the same everywhere. Uh, it's really frightening, and you just don't know how to intervene. Uh, even training people, is, I don't think that's, that's the way, way to, to do it. Uh, it's not easy. So, Mtuli, what are some of the more successful solutions? Some people in this room might say, look, it's precisely because those doctors are not attending to their patients and those teachers are not showing up mm -hmm. that you need international NGOs to come in and provide education, to send teachers, mm -hmm. to send doctors, to, mm -hmm. or you need to privatise your health or your schools. Mm -hmm. What's your best shot at... Yeah. at, at mm -hmm a better way to improve those services? I would say two shots. I think I'm clearer on the education front and on the healthcare front. And then the other is a social entrepreneurship solution mm -hmm. uh, uh, with NGOs involved. On, on, on teachers, I would say what we find as well, the more parents uh, get involved in the school boards, into the, the whole planning of the running of the institutions at that local level, the more teachers are held to account and the more they show up. I don't know what we do with doctors, though. <laughs> I need to figure that out. But, but what I've seen, a model that, if I can uh, use the, the Grameen health model, which I think is an interesting model, where uh, well, it's not that there's a shortage of, let the doctor be available for one hour a day. It's OK. But, but what you do, you focus on, on developing an army of healthcare workers who then consult, let's say, 40 per one doctor. And then just find, find a way, use some social media, Facebook, or whatever for them to communicate with that specialist so that they can be you know, effective uh, operators on the ground. We just have to find some kind of low-cost model uh, to intervene because for some reason we seem to be unable to get the incentives right. So we have to change the delivery model, rely on less doctor's time and more on health workers' time, uh, uh, and hopefully we get somewhere. Maybe that's, that's another way to do this. And Charles, you're, you've, you've done the big, the big end study of this. <laughs> Well, Your the, best shot? Uh, so I'm just on the, on, on, the, on the education side again. Um, uh, one, I think there is a real role for NGOs here that's being proven in, in Africa at the moment. Tueza is doing, um, uh, throughout East Africa, you know, 
NGOs are running independent assessments of how much kids actually learn in school That's right. and publishing the results, which the governments aren't doing. Um, and it is creating pressure for reform, which is great. Um, and I, I just, you know, it, it is, by the way, internationally financed, some of it, but it's a local NGO um, uh, 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 running the show. Um, it, it is this accountability issue. And the evidence from Kenya, from Pakistan, from India, kind of whether you like it or not, is that private schools are spending a lot, on average, are spending a lot less money per student and getting far better test results. I don't think mass privatization or vouchers everywhere is the answer. One, I, don't, I certainly don't think there's the evidence to support that statement. Um, but, but two, I, you know, I doubt it would work. But I do think it points to something, which is when you've got a short route of accountability, you know, that parent is paying the cash, they're going to make sure the school delivers. When you've got that kind of short route of accountability, rather than up through the district education system, up to the Minister of Education, and then maybe to Parliament, and then maybe back down through the MPs, somewhere to the parents. When you have a system like that, there's no accountability. So you need to move to a system where headmasters and teachers have the freedom to innovate, try new approaches, do anything that works in order to improve um, you know, outcomes, assess outcomes that everybody knows about because they're public, um, have the freedom to do that, and teachers can, you know, sorry, and parents can hold those teachers and, and headmasters and headmistresses directly to account. That, you know, nothing else is really going to work. Absolutely. You know, they, they, there's a lot of evidence out of India on this uh, uh, State of Kerala does incredibly well, and that's because you've got highly empowered community oversight of what happens in education. There's the other story uh, that comes out of Harvard uh, of uh, somebody who was actually doing a photographic project and, and, and delivered uh, sort of uh, disposable cameras to kids in schools uh, uh, across, across India, and suddenly they realized that uh, where there was a camera in the school, teacher attendance picked up very, very quickly. <laughs> so, you know, we, we can't do it with cameras, but in, in South Africa, where about 93% of, 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 of learners are in, in state schools, mm -hmm. there's a vast cleavage between some parts of education where parents are better empowered, mm -hmm. and those schools where, where parents the, the power gradient between the parents and teachers is very steep. Right. They don't talk up to, to teachers. And we, I, you know, I, I campaign quite vigorously to, to have communities take responsibilities, to, to have NGOs come in and help parents and equip them to deal with this. Right. Because legislation requires parental involvement and oversight of the school, but it doesn't happen because people are scared. And, and, and so, uh, you know, you, you must create those gaps and, and bring in NGOs to empower communities to be able to utilize. And we, we publish uh, grade three, six, and nine annual national assessments mm -hmm. so that communities can see what's actually happening, whether kids are learning uh, 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 language and whether they're learning basic mathematics. And the results are abysmal. Mm -hmm. and, and, and all of it, uh, follows the contours of race and class, which is which is a big challenge in South Africa. Right. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Hello. Um, my name is Jamila Mahmoud. I'm from Malaysia, so I can maybe address some of those things raised. I'm also a doctor by training, ran an NGO for many years, and now working with the private sector independently as a researcher. I have a, it, uh, this discussion is very interesting, but it's, I just realized that it, it's very Africa-centric, and looking at the development paradigms in Africa and Asia is very different. And you know, coming from Malaysia, which has the same age of independence as Ghana, um, you know, we've come a long way, mainly because of governance and policies. And as far as m the medical profession is concerned, as a doctor when I graduated, I had to sign to work in the government for three years full time before I could get a full license. So it's about these policies that then keep doctors, and I used to work 16 hours a day, I assure you, consulting and working. So it's very different. And I know what you're talking about, because there's a neighboring country in Indonesia, 
doesn't have the policy and doctors consult for two hours and the rest of the time they're doing some private practice somewhere else. So these policies become very important. But I want to come back to this issue of development and the private sector because in countries like mine, the, the private sector actually drives 85% of our economy and therefore they are extremely important as you know, facilitators of development. And I think that one of my big worry is then how do governments um, and the private sector work and how do the private sector push for good governance and how do you ensure good governance in private sector so that you don't spoil the, 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 the journey of governments to become more accountable and so forth because let's face it, you know, the private sector wants to make money. So one of the very interesting um, case studies I read was from the Harvard Business School and Michael Porter's shared value concept where in Mozambique, one of the aluminum smelting companies actually invested in programs for malaria eradication. And what they discovered was the prevalence or the incidence of malaria in that community dropped from 80% to under 8%. And I think then they said, well, this is shared value then. We will invest in community development and at the same time, we make greater profits because of less absenteeism. So what I'm trying to say is that we need to find new models. I think that the current way we look at development has to change. And I think this whole, you know, I, I am not a believer in aid at all, and we can have a side discussion with, about that. I think we have had too many lessons shown to us on how it hasn't really worked. Mm -hmm. And if you read the recent Economist, mm -hmm. um, the, the big question of should we put just cash into people's hands and the way to end poverty is to put cash and make them less poor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that I would really love to see a South-South learning, Malaysia mm. and Ghana working closely together. There's two countries you know, of independence the same year and sharing, you know, what is it that worked, rather than, you know, just NGOs coming in to fill the gaps. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Matuli, the private sector, I mean, there's lots of examples across the continent of where large multinationals have had to address HIV AIDS or other health issues uh, for uh, their uh, own uh, reasons. Uh, absolutely. Let's take the, the mining sector, for, for, for example. They invest uh, almost across the board, but I think more pronounced in, in South Africa, uh, where there's also a lot of pressure and scrutiny, frankly. Um, uh, they're, they're invest, investing in HIV and awareness programs because their own work, workers are at risk, you know, migrant laborers, men separated from their, for the rest of their families. Uh, those are the kind, kind, kind of issues. Uh, the, the, ordinarily, the, the, some of the mine, mine, miners will, uh, mine, mining companies will invest in, in education, building schools, building hospitals, building clinics. Uh, I mean, you take, for instance, the, the city of uh, uh, Wangi in Zimbabwe, which I know very well, of course. Uh, the whole city just grew out of the, the mining sector. It's my whole mining town. And the services that the, the, the mine was able to, to, to spread around uh, is, is, is incredible. Of course, we've got in our companies like Coca-Cola uh, are working with coffee farmers and basically converting uh, 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 simple farmers is to, be, to be part of their value chain, realizing that all they have to do maybe at the end of the day is to protect the patent of the black liquid <laughs> and, and that's all maybe they have to do. Someone <laughs> else will provide the water, someone else will, uh, will uh, you know, uh, uh, even uh, transport uh, uh, the, the, the liquid, so you've got the owner driver scheme in, in place, and, and the coffee farmers will grow the coffee. Just empowering different groups along the value chain uh, is how companies are thinking. You take South African breweries, uh, I'm sure alcohol is not welcome uh, you know, by most people in this room, I suspect, uh, but they've got an, an interesting uh, barley grower scheme, which I've actually done. Uh, uh, I actually did a case study for Harvard Business School on, on, on this. Uh, uh, where they're empowering farmers to, to grow the barley. They don't want to you know, touch the barley, and that's what is used uh, uh, in, 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 in beer, beer making. But just as examples, you know, uh, where companies are involved and see uh, communities as part of their uh, business uh, uh, value chain creation in the first place. But I, I think that's when it really begins to matter. But if we pick that up, so about six months ago, we had actually here at Rhodes House, um, a dozen different mining and oil companies who are heavily invested in different parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. And all of them had the same story to tell on this, which is that they were prepared to build the clinic, the school, but what they weren't prepared to take on 
was an indefinite obligation to keep paying teachers' salaries, doctors' salaries, and such like. Um, and so their complaint was that government was too seldom willing to come in and pick up what they saw as government responsibility. You know, those partnerships are important, and they're important uniformly. Um, I looked at some numbers uh, uh, in the health sector uh, just recently. In South Africa, uh, doctors qualified uh, would earn between $65,000 and $120,000 a year in the public sector. Now, when I look at, at countries around us, and, and, and that part of the drive to get those numbers is <clears throat> to have greater equity between the public and private sector. We need to retain medical professionals in the public health sector. But our neighbors can't afford it. So we have excavated, I like your term, the public health sector in a number of countries around us because quality of life in the big cities in South Africa is pretty good and, and the salaries are, are, are not so bad. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, getting these balances right requires a different take. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the big challenges for us on the African continent is that Tuli should come back and I'm sorry that we, we're so Afrocentric. It's all we know. Um, but there are 54 countries, 54 sovereign states in the continent. The multilateral organizations, UN World Bank, all of, all of the countries are members separately. Um, but we don't have arrangements at work because you can't actually build capacity and capability when your countries are that discreetly formed. And they formed in that way because in 1885, a conference in Berlin determined what the national sovereign boundaries would be. And it was all pretty arbitrary then, and we lived within this arbitrary shape of things still, and it undermines the development process. You want sharp ends of development? We need to think through that issue differently, reconstruct regional economic communities, and then focus on how we build capacity. We need that as part of the new model, and I think we'll, we'll be able to uh, apply the skill sets uh, and norms differently. Mm -hmm. But as we do that, the infrastructure challenges arise as well, so we trade with each other. We don't trade with the metropolis elsewhere. We need an infrastructure that would support intra-African trade, which is at a low of about uh, 12%? Yeah, 12%. Um, it's much too low. And so we don't trade with our neighbors. We don't have infrastructure that supports cross-border movement of goods and people and things. Um, and that's part of the development challenge that I think stares us in the face right now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take another question now. Um, Frederick? Thank you very much. You raised the question, you know, whether government is central to development. We've skirted that quickly. There's consensus that it is. Do NGOs have a role? Yes, they have a certain role. I want to come back to the title of the conference, mm -hmm. Advancing Good Governance in Development, and you said that accountability is key. Now, from all the examples you've given, accountability advances when it comes to government have actually advanced a great deal over the years, for better or worse. Absolutely. Of course, people Absolutely. complain. Government is important. But there are three other actors where actually that are key to international development and that are not accountable. And those are actually NGOs, international organizations, and business. And, and their, their accountability failures there are so many. I'll just run through very quick examples. From our work in Afghanistan, 31% of the schools built by UNICEF in Afghanistan were in a disastrous state, absolute disaster. And now we were able to repair 80% of those, but it wasn't through any help of UNICEF. They wouldn't provide the contracts. In Norway, earlier this year, and Norway's very proud, and I'm Norwegian, of the amount of aid that Norway gives. The scandal broke that 10 years ago, a story about corruption in Norwegian aid was suppressed. It took 10 years for that story to come out. 
right? Mm -hmm. and, and there are many, many other examples. Now, in Geneva, I was meeting a major organization that delivers more than a billion dollars worth of assistance, and they accept that between 150 to 200 million of that goes missing every year. Now, it doesn't make any headlines, and they would prefer for it, of course, not to make any headlines or to risk shutting down the institution. Now, if, if that level of accountability is missing, completely missing, and this is the big taboo in our sector, we don't like to talk about it for fear that it will be used as an excuse to curtail aid. Now, Charles, you have great data, but still there is this tremendous taboo around that issue. So we hold governments to account, but we're not good at holding the World Bank, ADB, or NGOs and others to account for their big failures in some of these areas. Mm -hmm. What to do? Thank you. Are there any other questions on this issue of holding NGOs, business, international organisations to account? I'd just like to take a couple more comments on that issue. So one at the back there and then one down here. Uh, my name is Adria Baketra. I'm a consultant. Um, the, the point that I wanted to raise, and it's linked to this, um, certainly linked to accountability, and it's come up a number of times where people have talked about the interface between government and citizens, the interface between the private sector and government. So it's not just one element, it's how these different elements link to each other and hold each other to account. So in the last years, there's been a global initiative launched, the uh, Open Government Partnership uh, that was mentioned at our conference last year. This is something which is driving towards trying to link these elements at the national level, not so much at the regional level. So I'm interested to hear, because um, a lot of the arguments that, that have been discussed today are things that we've discussed many times. So here's a very concrete initiative which is trying to address that interface. Is that something for which you think there's hope, that it can make a difference to governance accountability at the national level? Is it another white elephant which is going to hit the wall sooner or later? Um, do you want to say, do you want to share with the audience the, the two or three main things that the Open Government Partnership's doing? The, the, the Open Government Partnership um, is it's, it's founded on the principles of transparency, accountability and participation. Uh, and it's trying to establish at the national level um, forums between civil society, the private sector and government to make action plans to address the issues that that group identifies the most important issues for that country over a period of time. So different countries, have, I think about 60, 70 countries have signed up to this. I don't know if South Africa is one of them. Um, and the frustration with the initiative, as I understand it at the moment, is that there's lots of lip service, there's lots of paper promises, but people are having difficulty penetrating beyond those paper promises in terms of getting citizens at the forefront of this discussion, um, which is exactly where people in this conference are saying where they should be. Mm -hmm. Thank Can you very much. And then a, a comment down here. All right, thank you, Dean Woods. My name is Victor Finkel, a student at the Blavatnik School of Government. My question is just building on the earlier question and picking up on incentives and accountability, but specifically between donors and the NGOs who take the funds. And so I believe, as has been brought up and discussed, that many NGOs mean incredibly well both to do the right thing and to obsolete themselves in time. But I think the incentives that come from donors and the way that funding is structured don't always create the right accountability mechanisms and the right incentives for well-meaning NGOs to do the right things. There are many case studies I've come across of NGOs or groups that have received grant funding to produce a particular educational computer game, a project or whatever, but then have moved on in order to survive to the next grant. And there was nothing in the incentives or accountability from donors to actually ensure that those products were used mm -hmm. and that the citizens are the people that they were trying to help benefit it. So just to narrow in and build on this question of accountability for donors and NGOs, what specifically can donors do from outside to ensure better accountability and alignment of incentives? Thank you. So, and that last question goes, and again, it's a question we could put to all those of you who are involved in NGOs or donor agencies, which is once a project ends, so once the funding part, the cycle ends, and this goes for the World Bank and the African Development Bank as well, how many of you go back five years later to see if the project is still working or has still had impact? So how many of you are involved in delivering projects or in aid projects on the ground? Go on, hands up, be bold, <laughs> right? Okay, and how many of your organizations go back five years after the project finishes to see what's still going on? So yeah, quite a few, quite a few. And the World Bank, Charles? 
patchily, uh, usually... Occasionally, yeah. I think, is the uh, <laughs> optimistic uh, <laughs> analysis. No, no, I want to disagree. You know, I, the World Bank actually, described as a knowledge bank, doesn't distill knowledge from projects. Oh, really? it's, it's, actually, it's actually one of the big tragedies. And so uh, many of the mistakes are repeated because uh, the lending takes precedence over uh, the development impact. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are challenges that I think we've got to talk about quite openly. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm going to take yeah. one, one more question and then come back to our panelists who have been challenged with three different questions. One about how we should be holding these other actors to, how they should be held to account. Um, and who should hold them to account, about whether the Open Government Partnership shows promise, if you do have a view on that, um, and then about um, this, you know, um, deeper learning from projects. But one last question. Yes, Anne. Yeah. Um, Mary, I wanted to respond to your point about projects and the whole issue around language. Um, language such as local people, for example, is already establishing a, a kind of hierarchy, if you like, in, in relationships and politics. But this question of projects, I think the, the aid industry does focus on projects, of, which of itself is, is problematic, because it doesn't create sustainability. And that we have to move towards an environment in which we create a very holistic and long-term approach. We build programs, we build uh, local uh, organizations we build capacity and we work in a in a seamless way rather than this in this rather uh, fragmented way and also thinking about that whole dichotomy that there there is no monopoly on excellence uh, that is you know aid aid agencies governments these are very complex institutions and very complex sectors and really I think the challenge is to look at the excellence within all the sectors and see how we can elevate that excellence, raise the bar and learn and work in a, in a complementary way rather than uh, in this rather dichotomized uh, way. And I mean, Anne, you, you founded CAMFED, you've been leading it um, for a long period. What for you is the sharpest challenge in trying to do that? I mean, obviously there's lots of successes in CAMFED, but what's, what for you is the sharpest challenge in achieving what you just described? Well, I think the, 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 it's the opportunity, really, to look at um, the broad culture of organizations. And I'm, when I say broad culture, I'm talking about behavioral intelligence. I'm talking about social intelligence, uh, financial intelligence, and emotional intelligence, the way organizations operate. And then when you find uh, the synergies, then you can actually create, uh, you know, really fantastic partnerships, really based on, on that wide range of intelligences. I think, um, I think it, it's a challenge, uh, but I think it's, it's also a great opportunity. And I think it is something that we as an organization invest uh, very carefully in. And we have, as a result, I think, leveraged um, our, our relationships very positively um, in, in Africa. We think uh, in, a, in a very... In, we think in a, in, a very, um, in a very holistic way. We don't think, okay, the international agency, agencies in Africa. We have an executive team that is made up of the directors of all of CAMFED's entities, seven entities internationally, five in Africa, one in the United States, one here. And that is a peer group. So what are the, what are the governance structures that, you, that can enable this, this whole approach and establish cultures that are, are very... Um, are very enabling um, and are very collaborative. Great, thank you. So, we've, so back to our panelists. There's been a perhaps, for some, surprising consensus that over the last decade there's been quite a lot of work in holding governments more to account. And that in international development, the real gaps are now in holding NGOs, international organizations, and the private sector to account. And I wonder just if you might each give us a, your shot at that. Um, and in particular, where is it that you think, or which of those three is it most important to hold more to account? And how should 
this room be thinking about that? So it's a nice, easy question. Mm. Mm. Charles, you look ready to answer. I, I want to go back to where you started, which is sort of accountable to whom. Um, I think the real problem with bilaterals and, 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 and uh, uh, um, multilaterals alike when it comes to donors is, and, and with the greatest respect to the current um, head of DFID, they're accountable to accountants. The, what yeah. we really care about is, right, so the money left DFID and then it went either to this NGO or this government and they spent it on this and we got, we got the receipt, we got the receipt, so we know the money was spent. Got the receipt, got the receipt, got the receipt, got the receipt, done. Dick. What a dumb system. Um, we don't get in to do, I mean, although I think actually just handing money to people is a terribly effective poverty reduction tool, because the thing about poor people, what makes them different is they have less money than we do. Um, but the, just thinking about this as a money chain is a ridiculous way to think about development. We're, we're trying to, you know, we do aid programs in order to improve outcomes, in order to have fewer kids die below the age of five, in order to have more people not have to walk half a mile to get uh, clean water, and so on and so forth. We should be holding people to account on those outcomes. And that doesn't just make sense because it means we can sack a whole bunch of accountants, no disrespect to accountants, um, and spend that money instead on delivering more. It, it's something that the recipients, the people we're really supposedly trying to help, they can't do the accounting stream from Whitehall all the way down to whichever is the local NGO supposedly delivering their project. They can tell you if they're still walking half a mile to get water, and they can be angry about that. So this is a way to empower the very people we are trying to help to be, you know, the ones who can hold donors and the people that donors hire to account to do, for delivering those services. We have to move to a results-based system of handing out donor resources. It's, it's the only way to square that circle. Mm. I'm reminded when Charles talks about the receipts of the Indonesian health minister who came um, about five years ago, and she said in response to um, a member of, if you like, the Northern Aid community, she said, why is it that you're so obsessed with the receipts that on expenditure once the money arrives in Indonesia when you're ignoring the fact that for every one dollar that's approved by the US Congress, only 20 cents reaches <laughs> Jakarta, <laughs> right? <laughs> All the rest is tagged for other agencies so, so, and, 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 and seems unaccountable. And I, I just thought it was an... an, an I, I, don't, I don't agree that we should uh, throw away the accounting, but I think we do need to be even-handed about it. Trevor. I want to digress for a moment and talk about the MDGs. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a discussion now led by the United Nations on post-2015. It's a discussion of people in government. We haven't taken forward any discussion about the impact of MDGs on the lives of people apart from what has been measured at a broad statistical level that involves people. The MDGs have been useful because they focus the mind, but they've also been deficient because they focus on primary education, not on total education, etc. Um, but the discussion right now in preparation doesn't seem to suggest that it involves people. The UN is an organization of governments, like the World Bank is, a, is an organization owned by governments. How do we get people involved? How do we penetrate through that dense level of government? And that's what, what's missing. And I think, you know, if I tie these issues up, because the Open Governance Project needs some kind of pushback. I, I, I mentioned the example of, of, you know, in South Africa where actual expenditures are published every month in a government gazette, available to public, available to the media, available to parliament and never once a debate in Parliament about mm. expenditure trends in here. You want open governance, I think that part of what we need to be doing is organizing communities differently. Because the example I mentioned about poor parents and the way in which they see teachers as being so highly educated they can never question 
is part of the deficiency. That's the kind of model we must reconstruct and as we reconstruct those kinds of issues, I think the questions about what happens to the donor money is going to be something that, that receives at least as much attention as corruption in government. The, the, the point is that, that I'm saying the end game is important. The end, end game in some places might be to overthrow government, but that shouldn't be the only thing that NGOs and social media should be involved with. It should also be in improving on the quality of governance, and that is, for me, the missing piece in, in the discourse at the moment. And I'm glad you mentioned the MDGs. So the United Nations Millennium Development Goals were exactly an effort to be able to put on a credit card sized piece of paper the goals to which every government could aspire, hopefully so that every citizen would walk round with the list of Millennium Development Goals and ask themselves regularly, is my government delivering on these? How many people in this hall could actually list the Millennium Development Goals? Hands up. Yeah, you see, we're the specialists on international development. I think it shows that there's been a little <laughs> gap between the aspiration of the Millennium Development Goals and, and, the, and the reality. Matuli. Yeah, the, the issue of focusing on results, and I, I agree with Charles, also what Trevor says, is, is critical. I, I often see how we design projects, and by the way, we, we, we will improve our project design, I can tell you. Uh, uh, just focusing on the impact that the road, a 60 kilometer road, is going to have on the community around it. If a road is an economy, if it's got feeder roads, it, 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 people can get to the clinics, the children can walk to school, mothers can get to the clinics, and, and then post harvest losses from farmers mm -hmm. in the community we will drop because they can get their produce to the market. Thinking of the things that we do in, in, that, in, in that way, impacting on real lives of people, is the way to go. Focusing on the impact is the way to go. And I don't think we've been terri terribly good uh, so far in thinking like that. So this is why in the new 10-year uh, uh, strategy of the bank, which I've been chairing, I've said, look, we have to go that route. Change the way we think about projects. Focus on, on the, the, the way these projects ought to, to be inclusive, to use a big word. But really it means that it must have a positive impact uh, on people. I mean, going back to the issue of, of the MDGs, let's just take the one on primary school education, where in some countries you're seeing, you know, the, the numbers were going up, you know, uh, more kids in primary school, but nobody was watching the school dropouts. Mm -hmm. Those were increasing. And nobody, nobody as well was talking about, is talking about the quality of, the, of education. So you're seeing the children coming out are very poor in their mathematics, and certainly very poor in their English skills, language skills, uh, uh, including the, some of the you know, indigenous languages, by the way, in terms of writing and articulation themselves. They're not terribly good either. They're not good in, in, in French either. So the quality of education the, the throughput was also a problem, but no one was watching. So impact analysis is very important. We must move in that direction in, 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 in monitoring the projects. And of course, in the bank, we have policies which we post out there so that the NGOs can go on the attack and see if we're sticking to our policies or we're violated. And on occasion, we have come under scrutiny and, and be asked uh, to explain a few things. I think one of them was uh, Medupi which both the World Bank and us were asked, I think more on the World Bank than us, so we're only too glad. Uh, you know. uh, but, but those are the things that uh, well, people are not go going to you know, you know, let us get away with things. I don't know though how we can get uh, NGOs to be held to account. I think maybe the principle, first principle of just being results oriented, being impact oriented is a good start. But I don't know who the police woman or policeman should be. Uh, certainly the accountants seem to be in charge at the moment and the whole value for money issue is, is driving thinking here. Yeah. Thank you, Mthuli. So it seems to me um, Minister Manuel said at the beginning of this session that development is a consequence of good politics. And our discussion has showed us that good politics is not just about politics in government, it equally <coughs> means good politics around a local school the engagement of parents who are empowered to actually hold the teachers and school to account. It also means good politics within each of your organizations. In other words, a politics which can lead you to have more sustainable impact. Where sustainability isn't the sustainability of your own organization, but the sustainability of that community's ability to continue enjoying the impact 
of that work. And I think that's the challenge that we're about over the next 24 hours, and we're all about it together. And I, part of the impetus of creating this group and this seminar of people was to bring people together in a forum which was not about, look how great what we're doing is, which there are plenty of forums to do, but a forum where people could safely say, actually, we are doing well, but here are some real problems we're having. In, and we think that the sustainability of impact problem is one that every single partner in international development is having. And that we would hope that this seminar over the next day and a half can really help find and share some solutions to that, to that problem. Just before I invite you to properly thank our terrific panelists, I'll just let you know that the, the, we will now stop for a break and then there are three breakout sessions where in small groups you can really probe some um, more detailed issues. And the breakout groups you'll find in your um, conference pack, there's one on technology, there's one on money, and there's one on remaining on, on the mission of the organization, the mission and mandate issues. You'll find descriptions of them with the people, and you'll have time for a break to chat, to work out which breakout group you want to attend and where it's being held. Um, and then, as mentioned earlier, at the end of those breakout groups, those who want, would like to attend Amartya Sen's lecture can meet in the little cupola entrance to Rhodes House. With all that out of the way, though, can we thank today's panelists for this great opening to the seminar?